Explicity Cast from Explicity. Recently, Indian author Gitanjali Shri's book Tomb of Sand won the Man Booker Prize. The Man Booker Prize is the rest of the world version of the Booker Prize. In literary circles, as indeed with other circles, awards and prizes always set off ripples of envy and copping. The cynical argument is that prizes exist only to trigger interest in markets. In this case, I presume to sell more books. Now, I haven't done a deep dive into all this, but it does make for great coffee shop mulch. So, whether by honest practice or by greasy marketing, a booker win means much to the industry. And Tomb of Sand, I dare say, will trigger the gold rush of translations. So, are translations the next big thing? My guest today, Kalyan Raman, is no translation newbie. He has translated the works of some of the best-known writers from Tamil into English. I have known him for many years. He's a scientist with a literary side. He worked in the Indian Space Research Organization as a satellite communications engineer. His first substantive published translation of a book was one of short stories by the famous late Tamil modernist author Ashoka Mitran. I remember meeting Kalyan in Koshi's Cafe in Bangalore the day that book was released. He told me about it. I walked over to a bookstore nearby and bought it. And I was introduced to the wonderful world of translated texts. So what is the skill of a translator? Well, translations are not something to be discussed blithely. There is so much that translators must know before they can translate. They must know the language, both the source and the target language the history of the author, indeed the mind of the author, and the subject. And then the translation itself must stay faithful to the rhythm, the cadence, and comportment of the text, and importantly stay faithful to the author. A translator cannot conclude that the author's prose could use a little improvement, for instance. I have held Kalyan in high estimation all these years, and I am fortunate to have him here as my guest today. Let's ask him all about translations. Kalyan, welcome to the Literary City. Hi, Ramzi. Great to be here. Hey, Kalyan. You know, they say that people process their thoughts in the language in which they do mental math. So in what language do you think? English or Tamil? Well, I haven't done mental math in a long time. <laughs> but yeah, I think in English, actually. Unless unless I'm I'm kind of consciously thinking about something else. It, it really depends on what... The discourses. Right. Now, as a translator, in what language do you need the greater fluency? Is it the source language or the target language or both? I think the target language is very crucial because, you know, that's the, that's the language in which you write, a translator writes. So you do need, you do need fluency in both languages, but, uh, but in the target language, it's an absolute must because you're going to be writing in it. Yeah. Closely linked to translation is interpretation. Now, do you really have to interpret the texts that you have read in the source language? I'm not sure about interpretation. You, I mean, it's just reading. I mean, is reading interpretation? I don't know. Uh, you, you try to get the meaning of the text, right? As as it is, and uh, and you translate the text so that. The meaning that you have imbibed or you have perceived comes through. Everything that the text has is refracted through the translator, is processed through the translator and how they read it. Refracted through the translator. What an interesting phrase that is. One of the writers that you have translated, Ashoka Mitran, is known to um, set his stories in rural areas where he uses the local dialect and parlance. Let's talk about the idiom. Does the idiom travel easily in translation? One thing about Ashoka Mitran, he also uh, writes a lot of the urban underclass too. Uh, and they have their own slang. And he does it, uh, you know, not just a city like Madras, but also in places like Secunderabad and so on. Okay. You know, the working class. Yeah. Right. So when you translate uh, the language that is specific to a social group, you, you you don't try to invent, you know, a patwa in English. Uh, what you really do is you do it in the standard uh, English, but 
with the tonalities and inflections and whatever as in as in the original i get that so that if you if you, if you can't invent you can't uh, say that you know uh, working class madras tamil you can't uh, you can't change it to you know london cockney <laughs> oh, no. english so that that won't work that will be mimicry not translation so uh, what you do with you write in standard english but uh, with as much of the tonality and and music and and everything else the attitude if you will uh, of the original yeah now what about proverbs now i know that proverbs are used quite liberally in tamil what do you do when you find one do you find the nearest english equivalent proverb you know there are some for which there are direct equivalents so that is not a problem but when there is no equivalent and it is very culture specific you can't do a literal translation you have to see whether you know whether it whether you can convey the meaning uh in you know so you need to sort of find an equivalent in some way so that that is that is that go that's on a case by case basis speaking of translators being aware of the culture specifics let's take the hypothetical mm. case of someone who is not a tamilian maybe not even an indian who is uh, learned tamil in a university say in europe or in america would mm. such a person be able to walk in and translate say ashoka mitran mm. Uh, i i really wouldn't know you know because uh, i've never tried it myself but uh, generally the people who translate even from the west to translate from tamil to english uh, they do acquaint themselves with with the with the environment in which in which the text is written you know they uh, they come and live here for some time and they come and study tamil under a tutor here you know that 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 has happened i know it to have happened uh so that is how things go you know there is something that i want to say here sure. is that literary translators you know they translate from a foreign tongue into their own language mm-hmm. but except that it, you know people like me we translate into what is really our second language english you know in this case uh so uh, the so called l2 translators so right uh, so we don't have such a problem because we live in the culture that we are translating we do and uh, because english is such a dominant language uh, in india in, in terms of uh, epistemology and so on we also uh, are fluent in english and if i were to hold feet to the fire on this mm-hmm. issue let's talk about reverse translations there are wonderful texts available in tamil of translations mm-hmm. of marquez pamo mm-hmm. shakespeare and so on so do these translators mm-hmm. have the same standards that you mentioned in the previous answer which means how can someone translate marquez into tamil without understanding the nuances of marquez's milieu um yeah they 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 try they read they read uh, critiques you know and uh, they somehow yeah i mean they see films even nowadays <laughs> so so there are ways to uh, train yourself and uh, i think that uh, you know i know one uh, english to tamil translator who who actually went to dublin uh, when he was translating the sea by john banwell he yeah, a great work he went and stayed in dublin for some time yeah to get a get a uh, get a feel of the uh, you know the environment in which john ban was writing about i get it see it all a matter of resources it all a matter of resources and opportunities i guess yeah yeah true too i guess we don't have the resources that say american students have <laughs> yeah yeah i would imagine that there is a considerable onus on the translator to get it right yeah which brings me to the question what happens if there's a disagreement between translator and author on a word or a phrase or the meaning is there a brawl who wins the fight the translator has the final authority on you know uh what stays in and what goes out and is that because it's your neck that's in the news yeah on the line yeah sure it is uh no it go, the translator is the author of the translation right so true so obviously it's only uh, ethical and fair that that he takes responsibility for translation is a fairly imperfect 
uh, exercise. You know, it is uh, and and it is endlessly perfectible, so to speak. See, the thing is that even while while you're translating by yourself, you have four options, and and you choose between those four options. What sort of options? Every word you have, you know, you can put it in. Oh, yeah. I get it. Yeah, yeah. I think you're yeah. saying that there are different options yeah. for each word. Yeah, you're making choices all the time. So when somebody comes in and says that, you know, why don't you do this or this is wrong and therefore why don't you consider this? You, it, It's one more choice that you consider, that's all, yeah. So there is no ego hang up about, about considering that. Simply because it didn't originate in your own mind but somebody else's. Right. And you remain faithful to the source. Yeah, you try to be faithful. And make it your own. No, you can't make it your own. Yeah, yeah. You can't even translate your interpretation. You have to translate the text as it is. And all the interpretations would be embedded in the text. Can you choose to leave out certain things that don't make the cut, like horrible cliches, for example? Yeah, you can excise it. You can excise it if it's going to uh, mar the text, as it were. Or you find some substitute or something like that, yeah. So as a translator, you own the text, so to speak. Yeah. You put your reputation on the line, as you said. Exactly, exactly. Even more than reputation and all that, you want to produce a quality text, yeah. Yeah, that is readable, that that, that, that the reader can get some pleasure out of reading it, so. Someone told me that writing in Tamil necessarily means having to be aware of uh, its literary traditions. So is literary tradition a yoke? Uh, I don't think that is true. Uh, Why? Because, uh, you know, most of the modern writers, most of them, Mm -hmm. uh, haven't formally studied Tamil. Okay. Or haven't formally studied, uh, you know, the, the works from that tradition. You know, those works were written uh, in a time when much of the modern condition didn't exist. Obviously. No cars and planes. And, and you know, you do have a sense of what the language can do. Definitely, if you read Sangam poetry or uh, or you get a tenor of, of, of emotion. There, there must be traces of, of that tradition in, in whatever is written now. Uh, but, it's, but neither a yoke nor particularly an enabler. Has uh, Tamil writing changed in the, say, 40s, 50s, 60s and afterwards? Is uh, there a difference and is there a line in the sand when things may have changed? <laughs> this is a vast question because uh, because the modernist Tamil literature ha- has also been evolving in the past 70, 80 years. And uh, therefore, more and more people have have come into the, you know, the literary culture different groups, you know, and they are writing about their lives and they're telling their stories. You know, the working class people, the subalterns, the fishermen, and, and so on and so on. So, yeah, there is no line in the sand, but there is a there's a constant change, I think, yeah. Change and the language expands to, uh, you know, to, 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 to expand its scope, really, of what it can handle and what it can talk about. Uh, you know, and, and Tamils themselves move into new areas, right? They do. Yes, they do. The diaspora. And now the diaspora are old civilization in many of the places they live, like Fiji, Sri Lanka, Singapore, Malaysia, Mauritius. So is there a new literature that's coming from this diaspora? Sri Lanka definitely, before all this trouble and, and even... Uh, uh, now from the diaspora, they, there's some excellent writers uh, in the, among them. Some of them are actually geniuses. Mm-hmm. And some of them have even participated in uh, in the unearthing of the ancient texts, right. you know, like Damodar Pillai and so on. So, so, so they participate in the culture. Sri Lanka particularly is, is uh, they are deeply engaged in Tamil and, and uh, literary production in Tamil. Yeah. So can we expect that non-resident Indian Tamils who don't have literary foundations in Tamil will become a part of the writing mainstream? Yes, I mean like I'm not a I, I can't predict the future, but but there is a possibility that that they will. In contrast with how old Tamil really is, modern literature is surprisingly recent, isn't it? You know, modernist literature in Tamil is only about, you know, 
150 years old at the most. Right. You know, all these formats of prose fiction, uh, blank verse, free verse, and all that is, is coming to it very recently. So has modern Tamil literature made it to the curriculum? Yes, of course, yeah. Definitely. How so? Uh, how, how recent? No, I think that uh, it has always been there. I mean, um, you know, uh, the six, from the 60s on. Mm-hmm. But uh, from the 60s, in, in the 60s and so on, 60s, even 70s, uh, you had this traditional Tamil scholars who were studied, you know, uh, the pundits, so to speak. Uh, but after that, yeah, the, the uh, modern literary texts uh, are being prescribed. And uh, sometimes even translations are being prescribed. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, to get back to your translations of books, I found that there's a palpable difference in the styles and substance of um, Ashoka Mitran from, say, Devi Bharati. Now, Devi Bharati's prose I found to be very dense and complex and involved, whereas Ashoka Mitran's text was light and almost Hemingway-esque, simple declarative sentences. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. But what Ashoka Mitran does is to leave a lot unsaid. There's a lot of, uh, a lot between the lines in his his, 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 uh, prose fiction, whereas uh, Devi Bharati, he's dense, but uh, he... There is a sort of Tolstoyan, uh, you know, pondering in his writing. <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> <Which> I, like. <laughs> I like that. Yes, that's right. Well, then that's testament to your translation abilities, because then I was reading those writers and not Kalyan. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the even the translated uh, work, I mean, it's not my, I mean, the translation is mine, but the work is the author's, so... You should read like the authors, yeah. I was thinking, what a wealth of literature there is waiting to be introduced. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. So as I said in the monologue, I think that translations are going to be the next big thing in English language publishing in India. Absolutely, yeah. As a devotee of great first lines, I was very taken up by the first line from Pumani's Heat. It goes, Chidambaram had only planned to hack off the man's right arm. (laughs) <laughs> Not exactly a snooze. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, very gripping. Cool. The whole novel is very gripping. Yeah. yeah. Now, I want to move on to the business of trans, the business of translations, quite literally. Mm-hmm. And even though my again, my question could be applied to the vernacular, but we'll talk about Tamil. Uh, you know, provincial media has a much larger following. Google, for example, mm-hmm. in a 2017 report, I think it was said that they expect the next 500 million new readers will be readers in the vernacular media. I imagine Mm. quite a few Mm. of them will be Mm. Tamil readers. So what does translating into English achieve? More glory, more money? Why? Good question. Uh, You know, I think this kind of translation has been happening for a long time. You know, the the, uh, for instance, the English... uh, Evangelists who came here, uh, they right. they translated in the, in the 18th and 19th century. They translated a lot of our texts into English. Mm-hmm. Uh, just 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 a part of their Orientalism, you know, right. getting to know us and then getting to define us. Mm, that's true. Isn't it? <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, uh, translation always has a kind of you know when it's done as a movement, uh, it always mm-hmm. has something at the back of it, right? You know the. Uh, for instance, there was a lot of translation in the first half of the 20th century in India between languages, mm-hmm. uh, right. largely because it was necessitated by the freedom movement. Yes, I understand. You know, uh, Gandhi had to write in Gujarati as well as in English. And, you know, uh, Tagore was translated into all the Indian languages because he was a, he was a great national figure mm-hmm. and, and so on. And Bankim and all these people, they were all translated into Tamil. At that time, so so that was okay. Uh, that but you were talking about how Tamil uh, works were translated to English, right? Partially, you made the example of how during the freedom movement, texts from one Indian language had to be translated into a multiplicity mm-hmm. of Indian languages. The parallel to me is Europe. 
texts in one European language have, have to be translated into so many languages for it to be read across Europe. But in India, we have English. Yet my concern is yeah. commercial. Why should publishers bother with the Anglophones in conditions of very heavy domestic vernacular markets? And my resulting concern is that I would be personally poorer for not being able to access English language translations of uh, Indian texts. Yeah, okay. Translation happens, I think, purely for aesthetic cultural reasons. Kalyan, I would be skeptical mm -hmm. about believing that private publishers would worry about the cultural and the aesthetic. See, the thing is that the private business actually, I mean, the English language publishing, it, I, I think I think it took off, uh, you know, it took its present shape only over the past 30 years, right? Since Penguin sure. India, Penguin came to India and then, you know, HarperCollins set up you're, a division. You're, you're right. Yeah. That, that upward, yeah, upward yeah, movement yeah, is now. Yeah. Uh, so before that, it was all textbooks, right? Orient, Orient, sure. what is now Orient sure. Black Swan and, and so on. Uh, okay. So it is a very, very recent phenomenon. And uh, there are two reasons for it. One is that uh, by the 1990s, there was a very substantial population of uh, uh, people who could read in English, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, you could, if you, if you published a book, you can sell a few thousand copies, you know, that was the thing. Right. And then the second thing is that this Anglophone community also aspired to be world class and aspired to produce its own literature. Sure. Okay. So, so, so there was a kind of uh, business opportunity there. And I think that uh, that's what the multinational publishing houses the conglomerate but that's, but that's writing, but that is the writing in English. Yeah, right. Okay, so... Not writing into English. Yeah, that's right. Once they produced, uh, you know, once they started uh, this in earnest, the Indian writing in English got going, uh, the translation into English grew side by side, you know, because... Mm. Uh, uh, because it kind of, it, it made for variety for one thing. And uh, the, right. the second thing is that uh, uh, it, it also kind of... Uh, and it's good for local context, isn't it? The sense of the familiar. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, right. Precisely, precisely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You couldn't, you couldn't really, you couldn't call yourself uh, a literary. And you know, initially there was a there was a great skepticism about uh, both what is available in the in the regional languages or Indian languages, and there was skepticism about the translation also about the quality of translation. Uh, what you exactly know, do uh, you mean? Uh, I mean, there was this assumption that people who only knew English mm -hmm. uh, wrote English better than <laughs> people who uh, knew the Indian languages. But yeah, uh, all that was kind of dispelled and, you know, uh, here we are where we are now. Well, that's not a bad thing, is it? Yeah, yeah, it's not a bad thing at all. So, that we do have a very flourishing line in, in, in publishing translations of uh, Indian language works into English. Well, I guess that the attendant benefit is that it gives Indian authors a gateway to the world. They yeah. can sell their books worldwide. And a couple of well-placed awards wouldn't hurt. Yeah. Do you like awards? Yeah, I mean, they're okay. I mean, uh, <laughs> if you get them. Uh, <laughs> but you have, haven't you? Uh, yeah, a couple. Uh, mainly from uh, from the uh, Tamil side of the literary milieu, which is that which? Canada lit. Uh, Tamil Literary Garden. There's a uh, there's a organization, and they give uh, awards each year. And I think in 2015, I got for Favel Mahatma. And then now uh, in 2017, uh, I got the Pudumai Pitten Memorial Award for uh, contribution to Tamil literature uh, through my translations. Well, so, belated congratulations. Uh, Tell me what's on your bedside yeah, table. Yeah. What are you reading? What's on my bedside table? Uh, there's a biography of uh, uh, of Deva Gauda by my friend Shubhata. And uh, and a Tamil translation of Bashir, Vaikam Mohamad Bashir's novels. What do you read more of? Tamil or English? I mean, uh, I try to read uh, 
you know, a sufficient amount in both languages. But I think English, yeah, English can far outweighs what I read in Tamil. And my final question, as a writer, is your muse satisfied with translating the works of others? Yeah. Or is there an author's byline in there champing at the bit? <laughs> then nobody inside me wanting to write a story. I might want to write something. Uh, you know, I've been a technocrat uh, and I'm also interested in politics in some way. I'm also interested in language. Uh, so I may write something. Uh, you know, uh, there are uh, nonfiction ideas bubbling inside me. So if I find the time. I... Yeah, but you know, that's... Uh, that's not because I, I think translation is a lesser activity. I don't believe anyone should think that. But yeah, I mean, it will be something different and I would like it. Yeah. Well, without your translation, I wouldn't have been able to read Ashoka Mitran, Salma, Devi Bharati, Permal Murugan. Uh, who did I leave out? Devi uh, Pumani. And Pumani, yes. And Vasanti, who was my guest on the previous episode. And whose book, Breaking Free, you translated. And Breaking Free mm -hmm. is now available on the shelves. And there's a link in the podcast description as to where yeah. you can buy it. And I hope to be one of the first people to lay his hands on whatever book you choose to write. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah. Kalyan, thank you so much for being my guest today on The Literary City. Yeah, thank you for having me on the show. And uh, hope we can catch up in Bangalore sometime soon. There's a cup of coffee with your name on it in Koshi's. <laughs> yes. Well, translations are going to be the next big thing. And you just heard one of the pioneers of the craft, Kalyan Raman. Stay in your seats. I'll be back with What's That Word? And I'm back with What's That Word? The fun segment where we look at words and phrases that we use all the time but never stop to think about. And to help me with it is my co-host, she doesn't need me to introduce her to you. She does a great job herself. Hello. My name is Pranati, but you can call me P. That's P with an A, not another E. Hello, P with an A. What gives today? You know, in that last episode, we talked about words where the P is silent. Yes, we did. We missed one. Oh, really? And what might that be? Well, Radha Thomas pointed out that we missed psoriasis. Really? Who'd miss psoriasis? <laughs> Us, apparently. Hmm. Well, Radha is like that. You know, once in an editorial meeting in Explo City, I was eloquently pointing out to the sub-editors gathered over there how each word in the English language is finely nuanced and that no two words mean the same. And? Well, after my grand finish with a flourish, Radha quietly says, flammable and inflammable. <laughs> That is so true. There is no difference between the two. All yeah, right. <laughs> Hoist by my own petard. <laughs> Indeed. Okay. Did you get anything from our guest on the interview today? Yeah, your interview with Kalyan Raman was so informative. Mm. So I take it translations are the next big thing. Stands to reason. There's so much provincial literature out there aching to get translated. And for many Indian readers, there is a greater relevance uh, to reading a murder mystery set in their own backyard than, say, in Lubbock, Texas. <laughs> yeah. And isn't there the danger of greater insularity? I mean, like an end of curiosity about the rest of the world and other cultures? Well, more's the pity. Yeah, that's my feeling too. And creativity often follows the money. What, what to do about that? Anyway, according to the late author, Benjamin Barber, who wrote this brilliant book called Jihad versus Mac World, he said the more technology breaks down borders, the more insular people will actually become. Yeah, I remember reading that. That, that was a very interesting book. Yeah. But do you mean that as backlash? Sort of. I'm not sure that backlash is the right expression. You know, but here, here it is. Everyone wants to use Twitter and Facebook. But Barber wrote that with growing globalization comes a greater desire to seek out one's own. Mm. And I take it translations are one way. Right. And 
translations into the vernacular as you mentioned to kalyan like shakespeare and marquez right. in kannada for example yeah 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 that that works similarly except if they decide to do something silly in the translation like you know change the text and indianize it somehow how do you mean <laughs> okay i'll give you a facetious example in the early days when international women's magazines were first republished or published in india they try to localize some stories the result some real cross cultural howlers <laughs> what cross cultural howlers oh for example they would simply change american midwestern names to indian names but leave the rest of the story intact yeah uh, give me an example all right snigdas blue eyes <laughs> right. uh, here snigdas blue eyes brimmed with tears <laughs> when kulvinder said that he was dumping her <laughs> <laughs> and and I'm not and Snigda sniffled as she brushed a stray <laughs> strand of hair the color of copper rust from her forehead <laughs> Snigda looked at Kulvinder it's that blonde tart kushbu isn't it <laughs> this is hilarious <laughs> well anyway you know translators like Kalyan indeed Daisy Rockwell who translated Tomb of Sand and hundreds of others are great they are adept if not schooled in the different skills that the task of translation calls for but there are others <laughs> <laughs> so then if everything follows the money uh, then well, well then nothing you know the arts can only thrive with patronage the state and philanthropists you know as it has always been hmm All right. Okay, now do your thing. Okay, P with an A. What's that word? In the interview, you used the expression "champing at the bit." I did. Okay, go for meaning. Right. I know that the phrase means being restless and impatient mm. to get going, mm -hmm. and somehow horses come into it. Yeah, horses do. So dish on the etymology and once and for all solve this mystery. Is it mm. champing at the bit or chomping at the bit? Okay. All right. First, the etymology. Now let's break it down. The champ in champing dates back to the early 1500s, and it means to chew noisily. by 1570 it came to refer to horses as they bit and gnawed impatiently so you see that's the champing part mm -hmm. the origins of the word champ are indefinite but oxford has it down as middle english probably imitated they said i'd say it was even onomatopoeic you know champ sounds like someone noisily eating a, a slice of tail dry bread <laughs> and anyway anyway etymologists did not come to blows over the earliest recorded occurrence of the phrase champing at the bit now mm. reverend charles lucas's poem joseph it he wrote in 1810 had this line 12 beauteous steeds of golden color and with golden manes champ at the bit mm. now right now americans who have always champed at the bit to make the language their own instead of leaving it to indians changed <laughs> champ to chomp and uh, you know a recruitment ad in the daily review in 1920 read when the horses are chomping at the bit and the yellow legs mount up and the troops ride forth There is a thrill that no old cavalry man can ever forget. Mm -hmm. But much earlier than that, a story in the Ohio newspaper, the Newark Daily Advocate, back in 1885, still used champ. It read, right. "Little Breeches has been tramping down all the tall timber in his vicinity and champing at the bit tremendously in his impatience to tackle General Hoadley in a political discussion." and that was the first time that phrase was used to uh, refer to a human right and there's a word for that isn't there mm -hmm. anthropomorphism that's six words <laughs> okay man so champing or chomping all right i love digging this one out of the earth you know i went to google research and they have a google trends type thingy for words usage i forget the name of that thing anyway according to their graphs 
champing at the bit was in vogue for a long time, right from 1850 through to 1990. And they do that by, you know, searching for texts across books over the centuries, if you like. But chomping at the bit started by 1950 and grew like a rocket. And by 1990, it had surpassed champing at the bit. And now chomping at the bit is used way more than champing at the bit by far. And champing is all but archaic. Wow. But some still use champing. They do. Dictionaries, for example, say purists would like champing at the bit. But an authority figure on the English language, William Sapphire, in fact, wrote, and I quote, that to spell it champing at the bit when most people would say chomping at the bit is to slavishly follow outdated dictionary preferences. (laughs) Then why did you use champing at the bit? To be a bit of a bollocks, of course. (laughs) I knew it. (laughs) And that's our show for today. Thank you so much for listening. And before you go, head to wherever you listen to podcasts and smash that subscribe button. This way, you'll never have to kick yourself for missing an episode. See you again next Wednesday. Bye.